All right, quick review. Uh, what are the lawful elements of a worship service? Name six. <coughs> Reading and preaching of the word. Reading, preaching, praying, singing, praying, singing, <laughs> sacraments, sacraments, oaths and vows. Oaths. Okay. What is the regular principle of worship, and what does it regulate? Related to elements, circumstances, and forms. That question makes you think a little bit more. are revealed and limited by scripture, whereas the circumstances are determined in the light of nature, and then forms have more latitude. Right, right. Okay, so the, the, the regulative principle has primarily to do with the elements. The, the qualifier that I would want to make is that the, um, the form of the element must not compromise the integrity of the element. So, for example, there was a time when one of our Presbyterian uh, theologians, who I would identify as a new school theologian, with a lot more latitude than I, than I think was you know, right and proper, would talk about how you could, you could theoretically dance the sermon. Because dancing is a form of communication, it's an art form, and it communicates certain things. And it, it was, he, he changed the element to, to communication. So preaching is really the element of communication. And so you could communicate things with drama. You could communicate things with a dance. You could, there's a variety of ways in which you can communicate. Well, my, my attempted rebuttal was uh, you can't so alter the form that, the, that you end up uh, altering the element itself. Uh, preaching is a declarative proclamation of a message. And you can't dance verbal proclamation. So you've not, not without altering the nature of the element itself. So the form, yeah, you, 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 you can do, you can preach a lot of different kinds of sermons, lots of different kinds of songs and hymns and length of those songs and hymns and the sermons and the readings. And so that's all a matter of form. Circumstances, then you, there's a lot of latitude there. Uh, again, but uh, you know, to be governed by a certain amount of logic. You want to arrange the seating so that people can hear, and you want to you know, decorate in ways that don't distract, and so forth. Uh, you want to be sure to figure out ways to illumine the building, project, project the voice, and so those are circumstantial things that are common to all public gatherings that are left up to um, you know sanctified common sense. How are, we, uh, to, how are we expected to spend the Sabbath day according to the Confession and Catechism, doing what and not doing what? Resting and worship, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much, rest and worship. But the rest is holy rest. So, so if somebody comes to me and says, you know, I find that I don't really rest if I have to come back to church twice on Sunday. I said, well, you know, what you don't understand what the Confession is saying is holy rest. It's not inactivity. Not sitting around. It's uh, it's setting aside ordinary rest for the sake of holy rest, which means the refreshing of one's soul and the consideration of and contemplation of an engagement with the things of God. Um, so it's not the rest of inactivity. In fact, one of the you know, one of the characteristics of Winston Churchill was that he. He uh, would rest by painting or by building a brick brick wall in his, his, his garden in the backyard. He, you know, one of part of his philosophy of life, which I think is insightful, was that the, the way to rest is not by activity, it's by in taking up a different kind of work. The change. Yeah, it's the change of the change of the work that you're doing. So yes, you've got six days to get everything done that you need to do to survive in the world, but then you you you. you you cease from that activity. You give up all those recreations and employments. You set them aside. Uh, you remove them from the, you know, your vision and engagement, and you devote yourself to the things of God for an entire day. Okay. Um, yeah. What? Yeah. 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 Fellowship with Christians. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, when should oaths be taken? 
by proper authority on weighty occasions. So yes, uh, when good when imposed by proper authority and or weighty occasions, and they're necessary. Why? Because people are dishonest. Because you can't count on them to tell the truth. And so to put them under an oath where there are penalties, first of all, divine, uh, where God is being called on to witness, and the implied threat, this is judgment on dishonesty, but then also where there are legal ramifications. Um, next, may a Christian serve as a civil magistrate, and what are his duties? Can he serve as a civil magistrate? Yes. Yes. Can he enforce the law? Could he inflict capital punishment, even though uh, Jesus says uh, to Peter to put down the sword? So why can he, why can a Christian serve in the military, serve in the police force, use lethal force, serve in a prison, be an executioner? Why is it that he can be any of those things and not violate um, Jesus uh, in the Sermon on the, Mount, on the Mount, teaching us to turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile, get the coat off of our back? How is he not, how is the Christian not in violation when he or she um, undertakes any of those functions? Because God has ordained a civil magistrate to uh, carry the sword for purposes of doing good. Yes. So when he acts as the executioner, the soldier, the policeman, the judge, uh, the jailer, he is not acting um, as a, a private citizen. He is putting on the hat of the civil magistrate. So he's not acting as an individual. It's not as a, a, a personal. It's not a, a, a personal activity. It is as an agent of the state, and as such, an agent of God, bearing the sword, God's minister, God's servant. So, what Jesus is is prohibiting is personal vengeance. When he says to turn the other cheek, he is not set, he is not abolishing the civil government and civil penalties or capital punishment, or the military. You know, in other words, the pacifists and the Anabaptists and so forth, they've got that wrong. They don't, they don't understand. A Christian can serve in those offices and, um, and, and execute those judgments because he's not acting as a private individual. He's an agent of the state. Jesus said the centurion had faith that he hadn't seen in all of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and it's interesting. The centurions are all good guys. In the, in the New Testament, every one of them, without exception, are good guys. He did say, treat people fairly. Yeah. Be fair with people. But that was it. So you go back through, thumb through your New Testament, and, and you know, the Gospels and Acts, all the centurions are good guys. You know, Peter goes to the house of the centurion in the book of Acts. And, uh, Jesus encounters with the leader. They have the soldiers coming to John the Baptist saying, what should we do? And nowhere in there is, stop being a soldier. Right. Be fair. Right. Yeah. Don't take no more than. Yeah. Be, be satisfied with your wages. Um, what are his duties? Uh, what are the. Oh, okay. Never mind. The back side of this has stuff about marriage, and we haven't gotten to that yet, so we'll go on to marriage now. So let's uh, begin to read. M marriage is to be between one man and one woman. That has some application today, doesn't it? Can we get past that first clause? One man and one woman. All right, so um, for Christians, according to the confession, there is no, there's no gay marriage. No same-sex <coughs> marriage. Marriage is defined as a man and a woman. Adam creates Eve. Adam, God creates Eve for Adam. Let me get this straight. God creates Eve for Adam. Is that significant? Do you know the mind of God by the acts of God? We do. What God does is an insight into what God requires. So could he have made Adam and another man? Of course. Could he have made Adam and Eve and Jane and Joan and Sue? Yes, he could, have, he could have done done that as well. And then we would know that polygamy was, was, was the will of God. Um, or he could have made Adam and Steve and John and Eve and polyandry. One, you know, one, one woman for you know, five men. Adam and Eve means that monogamous, but we now have coined a word, heterosexual marriage is the norm. It is marriage. It is in, inherent in the, de in the definition of marriage. 
Uh, neither is it lawful for any man to have more than one wife, so no polygamy. Well, there's polygamy in the Old Testament, isn't there? Yes, but it's never authorized. Tolerated, just like slavery, tolerated, but there's a difference between regulating a practice so as to limit its, um, its destructiveness. Um, and, and really, if you want to trace the polygamy through the Old Testament, you'll see again and again and again and again it's destructive. So you, you've got, uh, you know, you've got um, what's his name, raping his sister Tamar, and then Absalom killing, um, come on, Frankie, help me, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Yes. Yeah. Anyway, David, <laughs> Dave, David's other son, uh, one of his other sons. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, um, this is, uh, this, uh, you know, the, the monarchs slaughtering all the, you know, children of the rival monarchs. Anyway, the polygamy is against the will of God. It is not authorized. Marriage is to be one man and one woman, uh, nor for any woman to have more than one husband at the same time. So it, it doesn't forbid when there's uh, the death of a spouse, remarriage. With that ca caveat in view, marriage was ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife, for the increase of mankind with legitimate issue and of the church with a holy seed, and for preventing of uncleanness. So there's three reasons that are being given there for marriage. Your, um, your question is, what is marriage and what is its purpose? That marriage is the union of one man and one woman for life. What is its purpose? Uh, the answer given by the confession is mutual support, procreation, and the prevention of sin. It is the only lawful outlet for erotic or sexual desire. Now, the interesting thing, too, is to compare this with the Book of Church Order, uh, not the Book of Church Order, the Book of Common Prayer and its uh, wedding service in which it lists the three reasons for marriage as number one, procreation, number two, the prevention of sin, and number three, uh, mutual support. So it, it, it lists this Roman numeral two, no Roman numeral three, no Roman numeral one. That this change is deliberate. The writers of the confession are deliberately placing mutual support. Um, it's not good to be alone, right? That's what God says first as to why there's the necessity of creating Eve. It's not good to be alone. So it's for uh, mutual support, for companionship. Um, then for procreation, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And then third, prevention of sin, 1 Corinthians 7. I think that so often the Bible is, is, is both more holy and less holy than we are. So, you know, we would, we would say very, um, you know, sanctimoniously, well, don't get married just because of sex. Well, I think that that's pretty good advice. Pretty good. But the Apostle Paul says it's better to marry than to burn with passion. So 1 Corinthians 7 uh, that's one of the tests. Is uh, you know you're burning with passion. You better get married. That's uh, that's the only lawful outlet for the the built in innate desire that you have for sexual relations. You got one place to go with that desire. If you have the gift of singleness, and you're not plagued by that desire. Um, okay, that's fine. But you know, 99% of us need to get married. So this years ago living with uh, this, uh, my, my roommate down in uh, Miami, we were living in one of the church manses, and the church had a couple, three of them actually, four of them, actually, four of them in uh, Coral Gables. And uh, there was a group of us reading Calvin's Institutes together in the morning, and we got to the section of Calvin's exposition of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then Calvin, he, he really goes to town on the fact that if you, um, if you have sexual desire, you need to get married. Every time I say this, somebody says, well, easier said than done, I'd love to be married. Okay, I, I understand. <laughs> that is a problem. 
find a, a suitable mate uh, to marry. Um, but at but the time, your definition of suitable might be on the table. That's true. Uh, what do you mean by suitability? Uh, so, so anyway, back to the point. So my, my, my roommate at the time, who is now an elder at the Christ Covenant Church in Charlotte, he had been courting, dating this lovely Christian woman for months and months. And so the rest of us in the study, we then turned our guns on him. And said, Jim, what in the world is wrong with you? You don't have the gift of celibacy. What are you doing waiting around? You need to get on the bar. You know, so we pour into him. He asked her out on date that night and proposed. <laughs> Pressure. Yes. And they had been happily married for the last 40 years. So it was a, it was a positive, positive uh, thing. Um, so the three reasons for marriage. Um, the Puritans, uh, the, the Westminster Divines are reordering what the Book of Common Prayer is saying. It's not, first of all, for procreation. First of all, for mutual love, support, companionship, company. Then procreation is the natural outcome of that. And it, in a fallen world, it prevents, it helps to prevent sin because it gives a lawful outlet for the built-in desire that uh, is the reason why the uh, pornography industry thrives in this country. Um, next question is, um, what is marriage? Uh, we're still there. What is marriage and what is its purpose? So what I want to do is I want to elaborate on this a bit. This is in your notes, and I, I think that this helps un explain a couple of things. I, I think that biblically understood, marriage is a two-stranded bond. It's a verbal bond and a physical bond. Uh, that is, it consists of, a, of, of an exchange of vows and promises, of exclusive love, loyalty, um, intimacy between two people that then is consummated physically. To be married, both of those must be, um, must be in place. So you could have a verbal bond and you could be roommates for life, but never consummate the relationship physically and you're not married. Um, you could be physically bound together and never exchange the promises and you could be lovers, but you're not married. So to be married, there's a verbal bond and a physical bond um, that, is, uh, that is at the, the essence of and the heart of of what it means to be married. Now I go to there because we have some things that we have to make sense of. Um, what, I, what we have to make sense of is what Jesus teaches in Matthew 5 uh, where he says, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of, of divorce. It was also said, but I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So what's behind that language there, I, I believe, and then he repeats the same thing in, in um, Matthew 19 in this discussion with the disciples uh, where they say, in effect, it's better not to marry. If you, you know, once you're married, you're sort of there, it's, a, it's life, you're stuck, as it were. Um, so what, what, what is behind Jesus' definition there is you have, you have these, two bond, but these two strands, these two bonds. You've got, you've got the verbal bond and you have a physical bond. And he says if you, if, you, if you break the verbal bond, so you, you divorce, you break the verbal bond by divorce. You know, the contract is ripped up. The, he's saying the physical bond remains intact. You then marry another person, you commit adultery. You violated the physical bond. See, it's still intact. So he says you divorce your wife and you marry another, then you have committed adultery because you have violated the physical bond. Um, so th then he said, but then he also says, except for 
except for the ground of sexual immorality. Divorced is his wife. So go back to the two bonds, the two, the two strands. If, if adultery has taken place, that means the physical bond has been violated. The verbal is still in place. This is the reverse situation. If you, um, you are then allowed to go ahead and break the verbal bond and sue for a divorce. And this, this is why divorce always involves adultery. Either adultery initiates the divorce and the, the permitted divorce, this one, or um, adultery is the outcome of the divorce when a person marries another. So it's, a, it's this two-stranded um, bond. I think that's a helpful way to think about how you make sense out of the ethics of Jesus. And then also, if you go to 1 Corinthians 7, if the unbeliever leaves, so that's the other thing I want to make sense out of. 1 Corinthians 7, um, there the apostle Paul is talking about the unbeliever leaving. He says, let, let the unbeliever leave. One is not in bondage in such, a, in such a case. So you're married to the unbeliever. They leave. Is the apostle Paul adding to the restriction on divorce, or is he... Does he see desertion as a form of sexual sin? So the word, uh, the word is, this word here is porneia, from which we obviously get the word pornography. And they, the, the question that the Pharisees are asking, can you divorce for any cause at all, and, and, and Jesus' answer is, no, you can divorce for one cause only, except for sexual immorality. There's that word again. So, so Paul comes along and says, well, you're, you know, you're unbelieving. your unbelieving spouse walks out on you. They leave. Are you free to remarry? I believe that's the implication of you're not bound any, any longer. Is he adding something? No, I think he is saying that the desertion is a form of porneia. It's a denial of the, of the conjugal rights of, the, of your spouse. So that you could, you could still be married, uh, you could still be married and living under the same roof, but denying your spouse the marriage bed and be guilty of porneia. So you will have deserted the marriage bed. You will have violated. You have committed a sexual sin. You have, uh, by um, by refusing the conjugal rights of your spouse, and uh, this will prob probably freak you out a bit. There are cases on the books from Puritan New England, where both wives took their husbands to the church courts um, for for um, denying the privileges of the bed. And they were disciplined by the church. So, what uh, for what cause can you divorce? Uh, you can divorce for adultery, more broadly, sexual sin, including desertion. And that's uh, that is the limit. Uh, all right. Is there any type of church discipline? that can ever be more complicated than some of these issues of marriage and adultery and porn. No, I would to tell you, we do get involved in it. We hate it. I mean, it's just difficult. It's, it's often very complicated. It's, it's always heart-wrenching. Um, uh, but um, we do have an obligation as a church. We'll, we'll see that up. We'll get, get to church discipline here in a bit. Yes. If uh, so, if you commit adultery and the physical bond's broken, and then the innocent party chooses to chooses to stay, would you say that the physical bond has been like restored? Yes. When the when the marriage bed is restored, that is in effect it reconstitutes the marriage and and constitutes forgiveness. And in fact, you know. Um, Civil law recognizes that. I mean, at least when there used to be no, um, 
before no-fault divorce, when these things were taken into consideration, if your if the spouse committed adultery, but then you accepted that spouse back into the marriage bed, you no longer had grounds, which I think is correct because you would now reconstitute. Okay, you violated, you x out the sexual bond, but when you reunited, you reconstituted the marriage. So it's not like you could just bring it up later and then still have a rightful divorce. Right. No, you're gonna go back to the marriage bed and restore, and then you know. You know, sleep together for a, you know, a period of weeks, and you're gonna come. Okay, I, I just can't get, I just can't get my head on straight. You decide no. you don't like the cooking, and then you say, "Well, yeah, you, you did that back then, so now I'm out. I'm out of here." No, you re, you've reconstituted the marriage. You've re, you've reestablished the, the, you know, the two bonds that that of which marriage is is made. Yes. Um, just a couple of verses prior in Matthew five, Christ takes a pretty. Um, it's a pretty low bar for what constitutes adultery, uh, or even desire in the heart. Yeah. Um, would that likewise? I think he's is, no, no. I think he's not setting the bar for adultery. I think he is setting the bar for sin. Okay. If you lust in your heart, you're certainly sinning, but you are not committing the act of adultery. So there is a difference between the thoughts about the act and the act itself. Um, they're both sin, but they're not the same. See the difference, but but you actually follow through. So, in, in other words, uh, you could not say, "Well, I, I thought the thought, so I might as well go ahead and do it," because it's going to be, I'm, I'm, you know, God sees it as sin anyway. Because Jesus said, "If you lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart." Well, if I have, a, well, then I just go ahead and do it, because I'm I'm getting blamed anyway. I've got the I've got the demerit. I might as well follow through and you know fully earn the demerit. Get a little pleasure out of it in the meantime. That would certainly constitute unrepentance. So. Yeah, certainly would. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, paragraph three it is lawful for all sorts of people to marry who are able to, with judgment to give their consent, yet it is the duty of Christians to marry only in the Lord. So, will we do a wedding in which um, one of the individuals is not a Christian? So, you know, this uh, beautiful young member of our church comes to us and she wants to marry, you know, Joe Smith. Who is uh, who's not a believer? Will we do the wedding? The answer is no. We will not. Um, did that uh, get me practically dragged into court um, back in the early years here? Uh, yes, it did, uh, and it was a problem. Uh, but uh, we we will not do the the service. Why? Because it's contrary to our confession, which says here rightly and properly, and it is in fact it's uh, it's a uh, uh, you know, citing 1 Corinthians 7, 39, you know, that we are to marry only in the Lord. We're only to marry a fellow believer. We're not to be bound together. Go back, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're not to be bound together with unbelievers. What fellowship is light with darkness and so forth and so on. You're going to go into the most intimate of all relationships with somebody that's not a believer. How does that make any sense at all? You're uniting, you know, light and darkness. Yes. Um, if someone's under church discipline, um, like, for some reason or the other, they're about to get married in an under church discipline. Would you pro, like put off the marriage until we're no longer under that, or would you still marry under church discipline? That's a good question. <laughs> it is. It's a good question. Or has it I've been taught? teaching this class for 40 years, and nobody has asked that question before. It says something about you. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, uh, under circumstances, right? I will say, well, I'll say this. I think, I think we would. I don't know that we would do it in the church. Would want some kind of differential. Let's say, well, here's the thing. What if, what if one, a guy's living with his girlfriend and comes to us and wants us to marry him? Won't do it here. Um, we'll insist if they're to do it here that they join the church and that they move out. If they won't move out, they can't join the church and they can't have the wedding here. If they come to me and say, hey, we just realized how sinful we are, that this is wrong, we're repentant, we want, will, you, will you go out in the square here and marry us? Absolutely. Or here in my office, I've done that before, married them in my office. You know, they came to the right conclusions, and they're still living together, but they want to no longer to be living in sin, as we used to call it. Now we just call it living together. Uh, uh, sh sure, so as to you know, put them on a proper footing, yes. But we'd have to differentiate that from 
we have to make sure it's clear that's not an endorsement of their current living situation. Right? We, if, if we, uh, do we condone that? Do we think that that's good and right and proper and healthy for two individuals to be living together outside of marriage? And so do they have just a regular wedding here, white gown and all? No, that would be hypocritical, and it would be contrary to our convictions. We have to make some kind of distinction there. So the young couple, they've, they've, they've come to see that they were wrong and what they were doing, and they want to set things right, and they want to do it right now. Will we help them? Yeah, we'll help them. But there's going to be that distinction. All right, only in the Lord, and therefore, such as profess the true reform religion should not marry infidels, papists, or other idolaters. In other words, infidels and papists are idolaters. And then there's other kinds of idolaters, too. That's, that's about as negative as the uh, confession gets about Roman Catholicism, Papist. except when we get to the sacraments. Neither, huh? What is a papist? What papist is, is somebody who follows the pope. Oh, OK. Oh, okay. So Catholics and us. Yeah, so, so the, the reformers and the post-Reformation generations, like this is 100 years later, this is the 1640s, they would not concede the word Catholic to Roman Catholics. That's a Christian word. They don't own it. We believe in Catholicity, the universality of Christian belief and practice. Um, so the father of English Puritanism wrote a book entitled The Reformed Catholic. A small C Catholic. Uh, so they would prefer to call them Papists, even though it's, it's an insult. But they Papists, not Catholic. Yes? Um, where would uh, Eastern Orthodox lie in that list? Would that be considered like an infidel or another idolater? Or would that be considered Christian as well? Like, I, I just well, I think because of their, 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 the way that uh, icons are utilized in their worship probably idolaters, but though they never scold them as strongly as they do the Roman Catholics, just because there wasn't that much interaction between you know, Protestants in Western Europe and the Orthodox in Eastern Europe. Um, let's see. Neither should such as are godly be unequally yoked, Again, that's biblical language, by marrying such as are notoriously wicked in their life or maintain damnable that, that, heresies. That gives, a, that gives a hint at David's question. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it is making a distinction between someone who's living a godly life and someone who's not. They may be a member of the church, but under discipline, and does that address that at all? Or? Well, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the point, though, is uh, you should not be give, so get carried away with your lust that you want to marry someone just because they're physically attractive to you, but they maintain damnable heresies. You, you've given an example before of church discipline of an engaged couple where the young woman was found to be pregnant and they were under church discipline. If the timing of that were, you know, that it were important that they be married before the baby were born, you know, I have to think that would be accommodated somehow. It would. So you may be under church discipline, but trying to remember what we did. They were fully repentant. So I, I think we just went through with the wedding because they were publicly penitent. And we dealt with it by church discipline and admonished them. And it was a turning point in their lives. And she has, she in particular has come back and thanked me many times because that was the uh, point at which she marks her, she began to grow significantly as a Christian. Okay, um, marriage ought not to be within degrees of consanguinity, uh, con with blood, so the relationship, blood, blood relationship, or affinity. In other words, you, you know, even if you live in South Alabama, you shouldn't be marrying your first cousin. 
uh, or affinity forbidden by the word, nor can such incestuous marriages ever be made lawful by any law of man or consent of parties, so as those persons may live together as man and wife. You can't marry your sister. All right, adultery or fornication committed after a contract being detected before marriage giveth just occasion to the innocent party to dissolve that contract. In case of adultery after marriage, it is lawful for the innocent party to sue out a divorce and after the divorce to marry another as if the offending party were dead. Uh, now, there's some debate in church history about this, and the, the confession is taking a definite stand here that uh, Rome would not, at least in the 17th century, have agreed with that, or until recent times. So if you are the innocent party, uh, and the, the divorce is permitted, and you may remarry, as though your former spouse were dead. Is that what's behind the Roman notion of annulment? Yes. They will annul marriages um, with a bit of a sleight of hand. Uh, but... Um, Yeah, the, but the annulment means that the marriage was never was never was not a marriage. So if you, for example, if a Catholic, even with church approval, married a Protestant, they will probably annul that marriage if it's not, because a marriage to a Protestant, um, it's like a marriage to an infidel. Yeah, it's it's a dupe dupe. Yeah, I'm 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 wandering in territory I don't know enough about. I, I just know they don't, re, they, the, historically, the Roman Catholic Church did not regard Protestant marriages as marriages. Uh, another, because marriage is a sacrament, and so it has to be performed by the Roman Catholic Church. So if you're not married in the Roman Catholic Church to a Roman Catholic, it's not a marriage. Now, our position would be, I marry an unbeliever. That was wrong. I shouldn't have done that, but I'm still stuck with it. Right? That's right. That's right. You, 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 it's a, for us, it's a creation ordinance. It's not a sacrament. It's universally applicable. It's not, you know, the church does not have ownership of marriage. People in, you know, outer Mongolia who've never seen a Bible in their lives, they're married. Marriage is not the, you know, the sole preserve of the church. There's Christian marriage, which is, but marriage per se is not. Roman Catholic view has been all these centuries has been you get married in the church, that's the only legitimate marriage. All other marriages are not marriages. Moving on, there's one more question on that sort of related. You, when you perform a marriage ceremony, you're acting as an agent both of the church and of the state. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Do you foresee a time where that may be a conflict where you cannot do both? Uh, as some medical doctors now being forced in some states to be uh, forced out of some practices because they're required to do things against their conscience? I mean, it just depends on how extreme the conflict between culture and the church gets. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're a doctor and you won't perform gender-altering surgeries or prescribe gender-altering supposedly drugs, you know, will, they, will you be able to advance in medical school? If we won't perform marriages of our, you know, two men and two women, will we lose, you know, the authorization of the state to do weddings. I don't know, Warren, they don't really authorize us to do it. We just do it. Uh, and we sign, we, but what we do sign, the state's, the state's uh, certificate. You have to qualify to do that? I just have to be recognized as a minister by, I mean, it's very loose. Um, I, you know, I just declare myself a minister and I, I sign the thing. So it's a, it's a loose arrangement, which is kind of the part of the danger of it, that, um, be that if you, uh, you know, if you won't, I don't know. I think I think it's just true for law, for law schools and medical schools and other professions as well. It depends on how much cultural conformity is going to be required. And if you won't go along with the revolutionaries, um, and you're, you're not going to play the game, um, you know, I, I I don't know if you can lose your license and uh, get kicked out of the profession. All right, although the corruption of man be such as is apt to study arguments unduly to put asunder those whom God hath joined together in marriage, yet nothing but adultery or such willful desertion. Well, there it is. Um, as can no way be remedied by the church, counseling, 
counsel to counsel to counsel and or the civil magistrate is cause sufficient of dissolving the bond of marriage wherein a public and orderly course of proceeding is to be observed and the persons concerned in it will not live to their own wills and discretion in their own cases. I just think that's a very important point right there um, that even when there is adultery or desertion you, the counsel here is that you just don't get up and leave. You don't just um, you know, unilaterally make a decision that this marriage is over and I'm out. Um, the, 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 the observation is you're not to be left to your own will and discretion in your own case because your judgment's marred. The passions involved in the dissolution of a marriage are so strong and so subject to distortion by our own self-interest that we really can't trust ourselves. So it's, the counsel is you don't leave that to your own, your own, your own, it's not your own decision and your own discretion in your own case. See, in their own case, you would, uh, you would rather, you would, you would rather proceed in an orderly, in an orderly, an orderly course of proceeding is to be observed. So that, to my way of thinking, that means you would go to the church and you would seek permission. So you're, 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 for example, you're the victim of a, of adultery in marriage, you'd go to the church and the church would uh, rule on that and say, in our opinion, you can remain a member in good standing and divorce your spouse as the victim of, an, of, a, of adultery. As opposed to, yeah, you know, just making that decision on your own. Thomas? Uh, I've heard there's a, people promoting that emotional abuse is grounds for divorce and I feel like that's uh, Yeah, it's a, it is a slippery slope, um, but uh, can you be under the same roof and physically uh, abusive, living in separate bedrooms, beating your wife? Uh, yes. Could you be just wretchedly horrible and have no intention of fulfilling your husbandly duties or wifely duties? and just verbally abusive and attacking and ferocious, vicious, um, and, and um, having emotionally deserted the marriage. It's a slippery slope, but I do think you have to look into that. Because, I, I, because you can desert the marriage and still be under the same roof. And you can do that with physical abuse and you can do it with emotional abuse that is so severe that it's very clear that you have no intention to, be, to being a husband or wife to your spouse. You've deserted the marriage. And I think you've mentioned before, like, what about like prisoners or convicts? Where would, you know, like, if you get a sentence of, you know, 30 years behind bars? Well, I'll give you one illustration. I don't know, there's probably a thousand of, of different cases. Um, let's say a man does beat his wife, and uh, she's never committed adultery, and she's been a faithful Christian, and she's trying to, you know, be, you know, follow what Jesus teaches about only for porneia, but he's regularly beat her and he beats her one more time. She calls the police, the police arrest him. She takes him to court. He gets convicted. He's thrown in jail for five months. We would say she can now divorce him for desertion. I mean, it sounds legalistic, maybe, kind of te a technicality, but he has so abused the marriage, so forfeited the right to remain marriage by his desertion of his wife by physical abuse that she is now free from the bondage of the marriage. It's hard to imagine that a situation like that would not also involve an abandonment of the marriage. It, intercourse may still be happening, but it's more like marital it. union is not happening. Yeah. yeah, it just gets really tricky. It's very, very difficult. And very, you know, it's just it's just difficult. All right, moving along. Um, um, who who may who may uh, marry and who well, may not marry? Um, you know, have to be old enough to give consent. It says, and uh, you may not marry if, and you're only to marry a believer and. 
who should not marry those who are, are blood relatives, close blood relatives. Uh, under what circumstances may divorce be lawfully pursued, um, ad adultery and de desertion, uh, and remarriage, uh, the innocent party? <coughs> Um, in the note, it says the Southern, uh, the old Southern American Presbyterian Church um, uh, revision added uh, to these grounds, and there were a couple. But is there a reason why? Um, well, I, I guess the the American one came after the, the original one. But um, is there a reason why the unrepented of would not have been included in the first one, or is that implied somewhere in the? Ask again. Yeah, the um, it says it says uh, yet only in extreme, uh, yet only in cases of extreme unrepented of and irremediable unfaithfulness, physical or spiritual, should separation or divorce be considered. Is the unrepented of portion is that is that uh, implied in the, the existing confession, or was there a reason why that wasn't part of the criteria? I don't know. Well, I, I think the objection to that, that that's stated in the minutes is that it adds a ground of very vague, gross and persistent denial of the marriage vows so that the marriage dies at the heart. So that it's not clearly stating, but lawyer, I read that and say, that could be, you know, what are the marriage vows? To love, to honor, to obey. How can that get spun? You know, you talked about the slippery slope with emotional abuse. That's an enormous slippery slope. Because that doesn't limit the marriage vows being violated to that of fidelity yeah. What page are you on? I'm, I'm on page 138. Um, yeah, my... Uh, I, I, I don't read that as it allowing the ambiguity of the denial of the vows. It's, it says um, after the first... Uh, sentence, yet only in cases of extreme unrepented of and unremediable unfaithfulness, physical or spiritual, should separation. It seems, they're, it seems yeah. they're trying to maintain some integrity while loosening the standards. They're, well, they're definitely losing the, loosening the standards. There's no question what they're trying to do. They're loosening the standards. Yeah. Exactly that. While trying to remain, retain some... <laughs> You know, some semblance of restraint. Yeah, let, let me. Let the me second let, clause let, has to be read. No, I, no. The part that I'm talking about seems that, to be a tightening of the standard. That's that's sort of the heart of my question. So the unrepented of the the, the original confession seems to allow for divorce in the case of adultery, repented of, or the, the new the new standard though. Um, Complete, completely circumvents the pornea idea by saying there is there are I, with the unfaithfulness word. I'm I'm keen. I'm really only keen in on the repented of versus unrepented of. The original confession seems to say uh, whether it's repented of or unrepented of, right. adultery is grounds for divorce. And this and the update here for the Southern American Presbyterian, says to say only in the case of unrepented of. But I think the unfaithfulness there, uh, on the yeah. one hand, you're right. The requirement of un unrepented of isn't in our version of the confession. But there are the understanding of unfaithfulness, it's especially the clause it, yeah. before that. Yeah. Yeah. They so, don't mean so I do read as quite a bit more. I, th yeah. I think the or spiritual Ir, uh, irredeemable unfaithfulness, physical. Okay. okay, now we all know what we're talking about. Or spiritual? Yeah. Spiritual unfaithfulness? That's like the health of the mother. You know, uh, abortion is um, 
forbidden in all cases uh, except the health of the mother. And we define health as whatever. I get a headache because I'm pregnant. So go ahead and get an abortion. All right, of the church. Uh, let's, uh, let's continue. Uh, the Catholic or universal church, there's that small c Catholic, which Protestants are refusing to concede to Roman Catholic, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ the head thereof, and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The visible church, which is also Catholic or universal under the gospel, not confined. Okay, so here's, here's, a, here's part, a partial definition of Catholic. Not confined to one nation as before <coughs> under the law. So Catholicity is universality. It's, um, it's the, you know, the true religion that is professed in all places at all times. Uh, it consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and their children and is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. Question, what are the differences between the visible and the invisible church? So here's some, here's some, here's the, some of the background to this whole question. Invisible church, also we can refer to it as the true church, uh, is the church consisting of all true believers? So you have you have you have the you have the visible church. The visible church is made up of you know, the wheat and tares. They grow up together. The dragnet pulls in the good fish and the bad fish. The kingdom of God is like a dragnet, and so you get all kinds of you get good fish and you get garbage. Right? That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is wheat and tares. The, the good, the good stuff, and the bad stuff. Um, uh, so, but the, so, what uh, can can we distinguish the true church from within the visible church, which is made up both of genuine believers and hypocrites? Uh, so, yes, the invisible church. For example, Romans nine six, the Apostle Paul says, "Not all Israel is Israel." In other words, there's two Israels. There's there's the physical Israel, the visible Israel, and then there's the genuine Israel. The Israel within the Israel, the true Israel, the true believers, the true circumcised. You've got a whole nation that is circumcised, but then you've got the true circumcision. Um, so that's, a, you know, that, and that's the language at the end of, of Romans chapter 2, where the apostle uh, Paul is saying the true circumcision are those whose hearts are circumcised. In other words, circumcision is a cleansing ordinance, and this is the cleansing of the heart. You have a whole nation of people who have the visible symbol of internal cleanliness, but they don't have the in, they don't have the internal reality of that. So there is there is the, the visible people of God, and then there's the true people of God. There's the the converted, and then there's the unconverted, all within the church, now, all of whom are professing Christ, but only some of whom are genuine believers. Um, and then then you have these statements that could apply to no existing church. For example, in Ephesians 2, 23, 27, 32, the Apostle Paul says about the church that Christ presents the church to the Father in, in all her glory without spot or wrinkle, holy and without blemish. Well, what church is that? And no church I know of is without spot or wrinkle. You know that famous statement by Spurgeon, you find a church, perfect church, don't join it, you'll ruin it. Right? It's made up of sinners, redeemed sinners, sinners, saved sinners, but sinners. So you're never going to have a perfect church. There's always going to be that which is going to disappoint people about the church. Why? Because it's made up of sinners, flawed people. Um, you know, the unity of the body in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Um, we have the titles in 1 Peter 2, 9. That we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and so forth and so on. And then there are these descriptions of the visible church, uh, sometimes as the kingdom of God or, or the church specifically. You have the wheat and the tares. You have the good fish and the bad fish. You have the mixture of vessels in 2 Timothy 2.20. Matthew 25, the wise and the foolish virgins in Jesus' es eschatological discourse. Uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Christ is addressing the churches and they got all kinds of problems. 
as do the epistles. The church of Corinth, I mean, it's a nightmare. I mean, it's just a chapter after chapter after chapter of this problem, and then the next problem, and then the problem after that. And then you connect these two things. Jesus says, I will build my church. But the next thing you know, it's two chapters later, he's talking about somebody in the church that's unrepentant, and you go to them, and there's a process of discipline that he outlines, and it's when the person's unrepentant, you tell it to the church. You've got an unrepentant person in the church. You've got a problem in the church. And then, uh, and then that's to be held with uh, discipline. So, and then you would say in addition to that, nearly every New Testament reference to the church is to the church visible. So it's the church at Corinth, the church at Ephesus, the, um, you know, the, church, the churches of Galatia. Um, so... There, there is this distinction that can legitimately be made between church in its visible form and the church as invisible, the church that we see, and then the, you know, those who are you know, the true, true believers. So, um, is the invisible church the bride of Christ? Is that, is that term uh, more broad than the invisible church? You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say like the confession, it's both. You know, it's both. Um, the bride is not in her purity yet. Um, you know, it's not fully sanctified yet, but the church is the bride of Christ. Um, I, I, I think he's talking about both, the visible and the invisible. I, 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 I would guess. Certainly um, we saw that. We saw plenty in the Old Testament, faithless Israel, you know, all of Hosea, as well as elsewhere. So the bride, who was unfaithful. So it would seem like that would carry forward. Yeah, yeah, it would, it would make sense. It would be compatible with Hosea 1, 2, 3. Uh, so um, the, the, what, what the confession here is doing is, it, is it's, is it's claiming territory between the Roman Catholic Church, which has historically had a, a um, lim limited understanding of the nature of the church in that its entire concept was of the church visible. It is the church. And then you have the over on the Anabaptist, the more radical Protestant direction, you have the concept of the pure church. And that uh, the only real church is the true church, uh, the pure church. Uh, and it does not uh, have any mixture of unbelief and um, hypocrisy or, or any of the rest. And confession is saying, no, we need to make this distinction because we need to make sense out of what the whole picture of the Bible is. There is a church within a church, the true church. But typically, when the Bible is talking about the church, when the New Testament is referring to the church, it's talking about the institution one that we see, the one that we belong to, the one to whom the ministry is given and the ordinances are operative. Okay. Um, moving along here. How important is membership in the visible church? Question number two. This, this surprises, yeah, this surprises Protestants, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. That is quite a statement. You know, I, we, we, have, we have throughout even the Bible-believing, evangelical Christian world a collapse in ecclesiology, a very low view of the church. The church is expendable. The church is me and my buddies getting together at the coffee shop and Sunday morning sharing some scripture texts and praying together. That's the church. Uh, that does not make sense at all of Jesus <coughs> putting together Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. I will build my church. And then in Matthew 18, the church that he's building, what's it look like? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, well, it's a place where there's membership. <coughs> because you've got this person that's sinned, and you've got another member who's holding him accountable. So that there's, 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 there's membership. And you, you can be excluded from it. Let him be to you as a Gentile and a sinner. He can be excluded from the, whatever constitutes the membership of that church. So there's membership, there's standards of behavior, there are standards of belief, 
Because if you violate those standards, you can be excluded. There must be a form of government um, and, a, and a process of discipline that Jesus, in fact, outlined. And the officers to, to, um, to make operative the government and the discipline uh, of the church. So that the church that Jesus is building in chapter 16 is an institution in chapter 18. So there's no getting around, you know, that... Uh, yeah, we, we have this little group that gets together at the coffee shop or in my living room, and we just share things together and have a little prayer time. That's our church. That's not a church. A church has officers. A church has membership. A church has a government. A church has a process of discipline. It has standards of belief and standards of conduct. It has a way to include. It has a way to exclude. It's an institution. It's an organization. It's a living organism, and it is an organization. There's, I know there's a movement like home churches. Is that, is that what you're talking about as well? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, what I want to know is about this home church. Um, what happens if you don't show up? Uh, is there any accountability? Are you responsible to anyone? Is it just ad hoc and you're in and out as it pleases you and there's no accountability and no mutual responsibility? Is that a church? Or is that just people getting together as they feel like it? So I, d I don't think that that qualifies as a church. Yes. Um, I mean, a frequent angle attack for Roman Catholics is that Protestants are so divided. And um, like, how do we, because the confession was written with this idea that they would be the church, like almost a state church. And you know, no matter where you were, you'd be in the same one, but like, you have 200 different options. And like, I mean, almost everybody's driving past a different church to come here. And like, we're all segregated in our Presbyterian. And we got the Baptists over there, and like, we have a few Baptist friends, and like, the Anglicans, and that we're, you know, that I can have put of any theological extravagance I want, and I just have to go pick the right Protestant denomination that. Um, and, and Roman Catholicism is no cure for that because you can go to any Roman Catholic church and you can find just about any, uh, everything that parallels us. Right? How about the Pope? How about the, this Pope compared to the previous Pope? The previous Pope was, uh, you know, an iron-fisted advocate of court Catholic orthodoxy, and this one is, who knows where he's going to land. Many he's going to land. Seven. He's going to land where the culture lands, because right. that's that's who he is yeah. tracking with. So you got liberal Catholic churches. You've got conservative Catholic churches. You've got, um, yeah. So I mean, we're, what are we to say here? We're basically a congregational church with a Presbyterian label. Right? We have a local pres presbyter. We have a session made up of elders, and we run like a Presbyterian church locally. And your ministers are Presbyterian, but. Otherwise, there's no higher court to appeal to or to, to which we're responsible. So we are Presbyterian in name, and we can sort of defend the name, but then in many ways we're congregational. Yes? Um, for the home church movement again, is that under consideration of like when you have the ability to be? Yes. Uh, okay. Because so like in China, I know there's home churches, but I don't know if I would go so far as to say that like, that's not a church. Yeah, well, the early rain church got busted up, but you know, they have managed to keep some discipline in place. Um, some accountability, uh, you know, Wang Yi is in jail. He's got like five more years to, to serve, uh, but they are, are, they're able to maintain some order and discipline through live streaming and I, I don't know what all forms of communication that they're using. So they're, they're not just little autonomous little groups meeting on an ad hoc basis as they feel like getting together. You know, they got officers running these home groups. They even move them around so that they, they are less likely to be traced and all of that. So how important is it to, to be me member of a, of a visible church? That wonderful Presbyterian word, ordinarily. Ordinarily, there's no salvation outside of it. The book of Acts does not contemplate a Christian believer not belonging to the church. I mean, right from Pentecost, they are added to the number. The number of what? The number of disciples. They're added to the register, as it were, of the disciples. 
It doesn't contemplate people being Christians and not being a part of the church. If you're a Christian, you're a part of the church. You get baptized, and it's, that's the rite of admission into the fellowship of the church. And you then are under the apostles back then and under the elders of the church, and you're accountable and you're responsible um, uh, to them and for each other. All right, so, or if, if, and so somebody who says, well, I'm not going to be a part of that, you know, I'm, I'm a free spirit or whatever. Some, some, think of somebody refusing to be baptized and refusing uh, to be a part of the church and claiming that they're Christians. I think that's a dubious claim. Why, why would anybody who's a genuine Christian refuse to be a part of the church or refuse baptism? You know, when, um, when our Iranian Iranian couple that joined here a couple of years ago, you know, when, he was, when they were interviewed by the session, well, they were interviewed by me first, and I said, if you're going to join the church, you have to be baptized, and he thought long and hard about that, and uh, when he met with the session, uh, asked, you know, to uh, Fakarian, what was his first name? Ali Fakarian, you know, uh, you, you know that if you're going to join, it has to be in a public service, you have to be baptized, and what will be the repercussions for that? And I said, well, you know, the, you know, you go back to Iran, might they put you in jail? He said, worse. I said, you sure you want to go through with it? And he said, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? It's quite a moment. You were there for that. It's quite a moment. So, yeah, refuse baptism. Refuse to be a part of the church. You're just this, uh, you know, this uh, autonomous little Christian buzzing around in the universe. I just, I, no. Um, number, oh, we've got to take a break. Five-minute break. <laughs>